know how many of you recognize that song, but uh, who recognized that song in here? Yeah, <laughs> it is a, it would be familiar to anyone with uh, small children, especially young ladies, because that was a retooled song from the movie Frozen. <laughs> <laughs> but we thought it was appropriate, that was Rick's ingenious idea, because today the title of, of my sermon is God's Fixer Uppers. You know, um, that, the situation that, that Will uh, was playing up here is one that's familiar to a lot of Christians, a lot of folks. And, um, you know, one of the most beautiful things about Christianity is our belief that, just like the song we sang a little earlier, God accepts us and welcomes us just as we are. So, we believe that God loves us with a powerful and unconditional love. We don't have to be good enough to earn that love, and we get to heaven because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, not because we deserve it. You know, I think that this disarmingly wonderful teaching of our faith is best demonstrated by that old hymn that we sang earlier, Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. We come to God not based on uh, anything but the saving work of Jesus. We come to God not based on our own initiative, but because He invited us. He invites us to Him. The song continues in a different verse. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. This idea that God welcomes us because He wants to, because He loves us, and not because of anything we've done to deserve His love, like Rick said earlier, is called grace. We Christians love to talk about God's grace. We love the idea that God saves us and cares for us even though we don't deserve it. We love that we don't have to earn God's love. We often quote the most famous passage for describing this idea, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We're saved from sin and its eternal consequences because our faith in the work of Jesus. We don't get right with God by being good enough, we get right with God by believing in the only one who ever was good enough. Hopefully what I'm saying is nothing new to you. I sincerely hope it's not. If it is new to you, I'm afraid you are not yet fully aware of how much your God loves you. But when we bring this important belief in God's unmerited grace to a book like James a book that is so focused on good deeds, something doesn't seem to line up. Let's take a look at one such passage from James. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. And then a few verses later, we see our theme verse for this series. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. 
It almost sounds as if James is outright contradicting Paul here. Paul wrote Ephesians. That verse about how we're saved by God's grace and not by works. It seems as if Paul and James are disagreeing. Paul says we're saved by God's grace because of our faith in Him. Good deeds have nothing to do with it. James seems to be saying that faith can't save us unless it's accompanied by good deeds. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that not puzzling? How can we be saved by faith apart from deeds if real saving faith has to come with deeds? I don't know about you, but it makes my head spin. How do we reconcile these two ideas? Well, thankfully, Paul, in the Ephesians passage, clears things up a little bit. You see, he goes on. He adds, for we are God's handiwork. After that verse, he says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Good works come into play with Paul, too. It's just that Paul is pointing out who is really behind our good deeds. God himself. You see, our good works are really God's good works. We are God's handiwork, his little fixer-uppers. It's like taking an old run-down car and fixing it up so that it runs like a dream. God takes broken, sinful people and breathes new life into them. He may accept us as we are. He certainly does. But He never leaves us where He finds us. That's what James is saying. If we have truly put our faith in God through His Son, Jesus Christ, we are not only forgiven of our sins... But we are empowered to overcome the evil tendencies in our hearts with the goodness of God's Holy Spirit. Like a farmer sowing seed, the Spirit sows love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And as we let go of the selfish, evil tendencies in our hearts that set themselves up against these things, we're transformed from the inside out. As God changes our hearts, that change is reflected in our behaviors. And our behaviors are the outward evidence of the faith inside. It's the evidence that that faith is alive. The good deeds we do then are not our good deeds resulting from our own efforts, but they are good deeds that God brings out of us as He transforms us. Why then do we have such trouble doing good deeds? Because we get in the way. In order to get out of the way, we first need to clear the clutter that gets in the Spirit's way. We cling to what is comfortable and familiar and easy, and we ignore that voice of God's Spirit deep inside of us telling us what is right and holy and just. We resist letting Him teach us what to care about because we're afraid of losing what we already care about, whether or not we should care about it in the first place. Dead faith clings to the earthly. Truly alive faith lets go and makes room for God's work. Maybe we've never learned how to hear the Spirit speak to us. That's the second obstacle we put in the Spirit's way. We have to learn to recognize His voice. That's why we need to read and to study the Scriptures, because that same Spirit was powerfully and uniquely at work in those who wrote the Scriptures. The more acquainted we become with the Bible, the more familiar the Spirit's voice becomes in our hearts. But even if we are willing to let go of the things that get in the way of our idols, 
Even if we know how to recognize the Spirit's voice, that will do us no good if we can't hear the Spirit speak to us. So finally, we need to quiet our hearts. We need to eliminate distractions, stop talking, and start listening. Some of us struggle to do that. We live in a very noisy society. Even if we eliminate the the noises and the distractions... Our own minds will buzz with activity. So when we're in that struggle, we need to ask God to help us quiet our inner selves. Let me tell you, in time and with persistence, He will. And you'll experience that quiet, that silence. And in that silence, we can turn our attention to God and hear Him speak to our hearts. You can do this here in worship. You can do this in your private prayer life. However you encounter God, and in whatever context you find that silence, that quiet, find the time somehow to hear from the One who can shape you into the person He created you to be. That is God's grace going beyond mere forgiveness and giving us the gift of who we are, who we really are, that image of God within us that has been marred by sin. He will get rid of that. My challenge for us all then is not to try harder but to obey this command from the book of Galatians. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Open yourselves up to God's work in you, and good deeds will naturally follow. So as we continue our series on James, talking about the expectations God has for His people, understand that these commands are not meant to be burdens. God will not ask you to do something that He is not willing to empower you to do. These commands in the Scriptures are meant to help us recognize the leading of the Spirit in our hearts. To learn, they help us learn His language. They help us discern what the Spirit is saying from what our own thoughts are saying or even what sin is saying. These commands are not calling us to try harder, but to surrender to the transformation that God's Spirit brings in our hearts and in us. They're calling us to let the fruit of God's Spirit shine through. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. For against such things there is no law. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that we can come to you just as we are with all of our imperfections and shortcomings, and that you love us just the same. But Father, we thank you also that you don't stop there. You go beyond merely accepting us, and you offer to teach us, and not just teach us, but to transform us by the power of your Holy Spirit living within us. 
Lord, ultimately, it is you working through us and not us trying harder. It's not about us trying to earn your love. It's about us allowing you to work in us. We are your handiwork. And Lord, may we be willing to be shaped and to be crafted by the hand of the Master. God, help us to know what we need to let go of. Help us to have the wisdom to find that silent time to hear from you. And God, help us to know your voice when you call to us deep within our hearts. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.